welcome everyone online and a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us in person. It is a very great pleasure to introduce Anna Pomeral, Pomeral, who I think in many ways needs no introduction, but has been introduced today already in a conference just around the corner, and we'll get a second introduction now. So in honour, we're so pleased to have you, Anna. So Anu Pomerao is Professor of History um, and Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University of New York. She is the Director of the Institute of Comparative Literature and Society, outgoing Senior Editor for Comparative Studies in South Asia, Africa and the Middle East. And she leads the Ambedkar in Initiative, which links Columbia University with the anti-caste legacy of B.R. Ambedkar and recognises his continued relevance to discussions about social justice, affirmative action and democratic thinking in a global frame. Anna Pomerao received her BA with honours from the University of Chicago and her PhD from the Interdepartmental Inter Programme in Anthropology and History at the University of Michigan. She's written widely on the themes of colonialism and humanitarianism, on embodiment and discipline and crime, and on non-Western histories of gender and sexuality. Her 2009 book, The Caste Question, published with University of California Press, theorized caste subalternity, with specific focus on the role of anti-caste thought and its thinkers in producing alternative genealogy. Currently working on a book on the political thought of B.R. Ambedkar and sharing part of that work with us today, as well as a project titled Dalit Bombay, which explores the relationship to past political culture and everyday life in colonial and post-colonial Bombay. And her paper today is Ambedkar in America. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Eleanor. I'm really, really um, grateful to you all for having me um, and for coming out, for those of you who have, and for those that I can't see, um, for coming on um, late in the day. Um, so um, I'd like to start with the title of my paper, Ambedkar in America, which needs parsing um, and which indeed is the object of today's talk. So the first thesis holds that the early Ambedkar's intellectual uh, life world has something to say about his intellectual formation that is both worthwhile and underexplored. Now the second thesis puts pressure on the term America and suggests that this place at that time played an important enabling role in creating the conditions of possibility for new forms of thinking and new frames of analysis. And finally, this apparently simple effort to situate Ambedkar poses some attendant questions and problems of the archive about practices of reading and ultimately issues of knowledge formation and concept history. So I think of my presentation today as opening up some of these issues for exploration by way of providing an example of a situated materialist reading. Work on the politics of the archive, um, longstanding, important, significant, uh, and the possibilities that it offers us of reading against the grain, uh, as I said, is certainly significant, but I think insufficient too. Um, and this has to do uh, with the question of critical thought, of tracing its origins, uh, and something that the new global intellectual history doesn't quite confront, which I think has to do with the possibilities, the conditions of possibility for something that we might call subaltern intellectual um, history and or subaltern political thought. That is the thought, the political thought of subalterns. So what does it mean? Um, first, I think um, we can think through um, ideas of far reading. So Jacques Rancière um, has made an important set of arguments about mass intellectuality but as well about delinking the kind of sociology of um, and sort of challenging the question of periodization and uh, the sociology of uh, thinking through knowledge formations by suggesting that we need to delink that from the question of the conditions of possibility for thought. And as you know, in some of his works, such as Proletarian Nights and so forth, the focus really there is on the capacity, the imaginative possibility, and the potential 
for subalterns, for workers, for art artisans to really um, engage with the universal in ways that seem to go against and challenge the ways in which um, standard intellectual histories or attention to social history and context might suggest that situations of mass deprivation, of exploitation, expropriation does not produce or provide the conditions of possibility for the uh, emergence of new forms of intellection or um, kind of you know, insurgent thinking. Right? The second, um, I guess, is to think about situated reading itself as a critical practice. And here I'm thinking about um, scholars like Isabel Hoffmeyer, who really provides a mode of critical reading, but also I think in many ways a situated materialist reading that um, goes into questions of annotation, editing, and in a sense, uh, how we might think about experimental possibilities for reading um, thought thinkers and their archive in, in quite marvelous and experimental ways. But I'm also thinking about heterodox engagements with Marx, I'm thinking about um, arguments uh, that suggest that we need to engage in practices of kind of slow reading, thinking through the emergence of new kinds of concepts or concepts that might be revivified or repurposed uh, in the context of uh, new frames of uh, analysis and new modes of critique. And then there is the question or the issue of democratic education um, and the university itself as a social form and what it might mean to think from within uh, and without the university. Specifically, how might one begin to think of this kind of complicated intellectual surround, everything from thought to spaces or the spaces where thought um, lives, the inhabitation of thought, how might one begin to think of this complex intellectual surround for addressing or engaging with the early Ambedkar? And it's interesting, of course, to think of his being located elsewhere, outside India, writing about caste. I will end by speaking and doing a close reading of some aspects of his 1916 text, Castes in India. Um, and so this is kind of the, the, the broad frame um, for what I'd like to do and share with you today. So although, uh, and this section is called Figure and Context, also, there, uh, although there's a long history of engagement with the history and politics of anti-casteism in the local languages, Vyara Ambedkar's thought has only recently begun to receive recognition in our public culture and among scholars of political theory and intellectual history, working in global metropolitan contexts and or operating in English. Ambedkar's presence in the body politic poses a peculiar problem. Namely, there's an inverse relationship between the scholarly neglect of one of the 20th century's most significant thinkers on the one hand, and Ambedkar's signal relevance to the story of Indian democracy and to modern caste emancipated selfhood on the other. Why has one of the 20th century's most significant thinkers been neglected for so long by scholars of political theory and intellectual history? The reasons are not hard to find. Ambedkar refused the colonial anti-colonial binary that structures much South Asia scholarship. He was challenged for criticizing the Indian National Congress and portrayed as a colonial stooge for his willingness to transact with the British government over the rights and recognition. However, Ambedkar's astute analysis of caste power has proved powerful and difficult to refute. Today, the limitations of Indian anti-colonialism's address to the social question seems incontrovertible while the demise of the Congress party is the bearer of anti-colonialism's historical unfolding, stands in striking contrast to the inherent globality and the durability of Ambedkar's thought. Ambedkar, I suggest, articulates a theoretical practical reading of the relationship between caste and Indian democracy and foregrounds the conundrum of ongoing existential suffering despite legislative redress. His investment in the exceptional subject, the Dalit, as also the universal subject of rights, the political citizen, is a signal contribution to political thought. It animates the tension, the recurrent tension, between the quest for radical equality and its persistent failure, 
set in place by constitutional commitments to redress. By investing law and constitution with the capacity to reveal and eventually replace the state's historic reliance upon caste power, Ambedkar's interventions effected an extraordinary transformation of the ground of politics itself. Ambedkar's prominence in today's public culture that stands, as I've said, in inverse relationship to habits of historical forgetting and invites us to reconsider India's 20th century history in the light of a more capaciously conceived archive of Ambedkar's thoughts, actions, and intellectual life world. The Ambedkar archive in India is dispersed across state and community repositories and characterized by disparate modes of preservation, documentation, and publicity. The coherence of that archive and its legibility are organized around a figure who is both complex and enigmatic. And archival unevenness in both form and content has shaped the scholarly reception of Ambedkar. I'd like to start by speaking to how the Ambedkar Archive at Columbia University, which is part of our ongoing project at the um, Ambedkar Initiative, enables us to view him instead as a hinge, uniting the scope of his early, uniting the scope of his earlier years, influenced by the global connections already present in anti-caste thought, and carrying that over into participation during a time of global interwar intellectual and political developments across the United States. Britain and the subcontinent. In that sense, Ambedkar himself prefigures the future archive of his reception as one that moves beyond current designations of archives as official or non-professional or not biased or disinterested of global or merely local interest. The initiative created almost a century after Columbia left, uh, Ambedkar left Columbia University brings the world's oldest and the world's largest democracies into a shared field of engagement with the university as a mediating link, as Eleanor mentioned. The initiative envisions Ambedkar's fortuitous presence at Columbia during a period of disciplinary definition, as well as intense intellectual and political ferment within and beyond the university gate. The initiative thus combines public humanities with critical pedagogy, and aspires to make present and palpable connections between the intellectual history of the American interwar and colonial India. This is a two-way process, and this is also a collaborative process, I should say, always a work in progress, and not something that any one, two or three people can in any sense hope to uh, complete. So this is a two-way process, rendering the history of the United States more worldly through inquiry into the transnational engagements of Americans, more typically viewed in their domestic context, while at the same time deprovincializing legacies of anti-caste thinking and action. An annual seminar uh, anchors collaborative learning and research around a digital finding aid for material associated with Ambedkar's time at Columbia University between 1913 and 1916, with a practical focus on archival storytelling grounded in the materiality of history. Students create and tabulate archival metadata and experiment with new ways to share information from podcasts and spatial maps to online exhibits. The finding aid is thus a work in progress, as I said, it's an example of the classroom as a site for making and doing, where student researchers engage with the materiality of the archive through questions and issues of categorization, metadata, annotation, strategies of reading for context, influence, and concept history, and curation via open access formats, for, in, uh, for, in, uh, for instance, using um, Hypothesis, Omega, or Night Lab, all of which are um, kind of uh, digital technologies um, for digital humanities work. But this allows students to present archival documents digitally, even as it interpolates them that is the students themselves into different narrative frames. The first question, of course, is empirical. Is there an Ambedkar archive in the United States? If so, where is it located? What are the terms of its constitution and its limits? Unlike intact personal papers and correspondence and so forth, which we possess certainly at the university um, for faculty um, who taught at Columbia, 
Ambedkar was a student uh, at Columbia, and therefore the university certainly has uh, the responsibility, you might say, to maintain an account of his doings, uh, other than the fact that he was there. And we know he was there, we've got the transcript and so on and so forth. But what I'd like to suggest is that we could go a little bit further, as I've said, to think through this question of the intellectual surround. And here we predicate the creation of our finding aid on iterative learning through making and doing a process driven by an open-ended conception of what belongs in the Zambedkar archive. So again, already the question is not so much about the politics and the ethics of existing archives, but as well how one might work through practices of what uh, my colleague Sadia Hartman has called critical fabulation, both to imagine and to document and provide evidence of a set of really existing social relationships. So at its center are private papers for this finding gate, correspondence, university and alumni records, photographs and other archival materials scattered throughout Columbia's rare book and manuscript library. Collaborative student research traces on Baker's engagement with important figures of the interwar period. Some of these, uh, some of those who trained him and played an important role in the formation of the social science disciplines at Columbia, such as Franz Boas, John Dewey, Frank Giddings, Henry Seeger, Edwin Seligman, and James Shotwell. A second layer for exploration is comprised of repositories at Barnard Teachers College and the Union Theological Seminary where papers uh, of the American Marathi mission open up yet another dimension of Ambedkar's experiential world. And then there are resources of affinity, such as Columbia Emeritus Professor Francis Pritchett's important and still evolving timeline of Ambedkar's life and writing, which was among the first to take advantage of digital affordances for public access and equity. Likewise, the open access SADA archives, the South Asian American Digital Archive, documenting the rich life worlds of the South Asian diaspora, not only expands the field of inquiry, but also serves as a model for the kind of work the initiative envisions, linking archive with sophisticated commentary and historical analysis. Now, the creation of a finding aid relies on reading across archival repositories, each governed by its own internal rules of order and organization, in order to knit together fugitive networks and to discover global connections we might have missed earlier. The RBML holdings, the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library holdings, are organized around proper names of individual figures, um, Finding aids are both incomplete and lack lateral connectivity across the archives, the private papers and correspondence that's held in the RBML. Instead, the finding aid, our finding aid, aims to cross-reference documents so that they reflect institutional connections across disciplines and discrete individuals, as well as key sites of sociopolitical tension and transformation within and outside university. Approaching the finding aid as a mobile technological template enables us to follow out emergent points of contact and to curate existing material in ways that emphasize the unexpected connections and lines of force, and in that sense to construct a new multidimensional archive from existing documents. This next section is called Inside and Outside the University. One relevant force field is Columbia University itself. Ambedkar appears to have experienced personal and intellectual freedom unlike any he had known earlier or since during his time at Columbia when he arrived in New York in the third week of July, 1913. His English biographer, Dhananjay Kheer, notes in America, in company with other students and colleagues, Ambedkar could move freely, he could read, he could write, he could walk, he could bathe, and he could rest with a sense with, with the, and he could rest with the status of equality. To him, life at Columbia University was a revelation. It was a new world. It enlarged his mental horizon. His Marathi biographer, C.B. Kermode, writes that Ambedkar was drawn to the pleasures of the city initially, and that he appreciated the ease of student interaction across lines of social difference, especially gender. However, he was soon to undergo a self-correction and spent most of his time thereafter in Columbia's library, browsing secondhand bookstalls and either taking or auditing more than 50 courses at Columbia, including economics, political science, statistics, history, anthropology, and philosophy. 
and he formed a lifelong friendship with his Parsi roommate, Nabal Batena, during his time at Columbia. Now, Ambedkar was in the city at a fertile time. The modern social science disciplines were just beginning to take on clear definition. University repositories invite consideration of how the idea of historical comparison, the analysis of social systems, the force of social democracy, and the significance of the culture concept were each shaped by interdisciplinary methods and aided by institutional traffic between social science, social work, and progressive anti-racist, anti-war activism in the school and the city. Um, Ambedkar's time at Columbia overlapped with that of the lo uh, long-tenured president of the university, Nic Nicholas Murray Butler, who spearheaded many changes and in initiatives by 1915, turning Columbia into the largest university in the United States by any measure. From when Butler assumed the presidency of Columbia uh, in 1901 until Ambedkar's arrival in 1913, Columbia's enrollment had expanded faster than Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Dartmouth put together. The graduate faculties constituted the largest graduate school in the country, and together with summer school and the extension program, Columbia was enrolling approximately 12,000 students by 1915. The university was also being reshaped from within by the growing presence of international students, women, and students of color. Attention to associational dynamics on the university campus reveals key connections between public activism, a diversifying student body, and the politics of the classroom. For example, Setlow established summer sessions in 1900, opened it to men and women on equal terms on the payment of $25. This was a liberal progressive move by Lowe to make university education more accessible. Summer sessions were often seen as a trial run by the university administration for minority and minoritized students, especially Black, women, Native, and Jewish students. Students often met prominent faculty and established connections to Columbia that outlasted summer sessions. And summer sessions were, almost, were always pitched or suggested by faculty and the administration for students who were deemed un or underprepared for studies. And the growth of summer session was seen as one of the expanding areas that would constitute the complete transformation of Columbia from a college into a university. Franz Boas could not teach at summer session of 1900, owing to logistical problems. But it is likely that he taught every other, every summer session after 1900. Frank Giddings appears to have taken a similar route. The Columbia Spectator archives, the newspaper, the college newspaper, show just how diverse the summer sessions were. There was conflict between students of different ethnicities, races, and nationalities. But summer sessions also allowed a particular kind of politics of coexistence and recognition to take root. University archives also allow us to challenge received orthodoxy. Seligman begins to look like a particularly dynamic figure in Ambedkar's sphere. He was also his advisor, surpassing the almost singular focus on John Dewey. Seligman's discussion of progressive taxation and public finance and international politics anticipated important elements of Keynesian economics of la lettre, while the training he and his colleagues at the London School of Economics imparted was evident in Ambedkar's book, The Problem of the Rupee, 1923, clearly a response to Keynes's Indian currency and finance of 1913, which would establish Ambedkar as a leading authority on Indian currency and banking. Seligman was also a founding member of the NAACP, as was John Dewey. He was chairman of the Greenwich House Committee of Social Investigations and worked along with Franz Boas and Frank Giddings on issues of social hygiene, housing, and the economic status of African-American families who lived in the Ninth Ward. Meanwhile, John Dewey chaired a committee on social education at the Settlement House. Um, and um, Barnard College graduate Mary Kingsbury Simkovich uh, headed Greenwich Settlement House. So there's a whole series of connections within and without the university. Now, she was married to Seligman's Columbia colleague, Vladimir Simkovich, who taught a course called Marxism and Socialism. And Seligman was a close friend and mentor to Lala Lajpat Rai, introduced Rai to the NAACP co-founder, Mary Ovington, and to Booker T. Washington and to Hampton Institute, Tuskegee. 
And Seligman also, of course, played a crucial role in shaping the careers of his numerous international students who would go on um, to do absolutely critical work in establishing systems of taxation and so forth in newly decolonizing um, countries. Um, so urban transformation of the period proved equally significant given the university's proximity to Harlem whose streets, churches, salons, speakeasies, and political associations offered a direct challenge to institutional elitism and models of scholarly expertise. Competing processes of social enclosure and social emancipation were thus both at work. By 1915, 80% of New York's African-American population lived in Harlem. Many had fled from race riots and violence downtown. Meanwhile, Colombia was actively, actively involved in creating a buffer, a frontier zone, between the university and Harlem. New gates were installed at Broadway and 119th Street, iron barriers me measuring 46 feet in width and 23 feet in height. And by 1917, student volunteers were, quote, aiding the police in quelling riots, mobs, and otherwise defending lives and property in emergencies. A letter to President Butler from uh, Professor John, uh, John J. Cross contained a detailed map of the Black population of Harlem from 1913 to 1926, noting that, quote, the possibility of still further spread is an increasing reason why we should control all the property opposite the university holdings on 116th and Amsterdam Avenue. Enclaving was a response to the threat of enhanced mobility and the fear of contamination and contact. And of course, I think as many of you know, um, this becomes the kind of history in many ways of all of the Ivy League institutions that are located in um, uh, urban areas that uh, are seen to be blighted. Uh, where you create um, one-way uh, streets, et cetera, to control movement into these campuses and so on. And uh, Davarian Baldwin is one of the people who's written about the relationship between the university and its political economy and sort of um, urban transformations and indeed uh, of speculation and finance and the deep relationship between the university and, and many of these processes across this period. And I think there are many, many connections, of course, to what's happening here in London around narratives of social uplift, of social reform, and the ways in which a certain kind of um, the practice of, of urban sociology, urban ethnography, and new modes of description um, around the neighborhood, around space, and so on, are really coming into the fore in this period too. So just some things to keep uh, at the back of our mind. So enclaving was a response to the threat of enhanced mobility and the fear of contamination and contact. Meanwhile, South Asian communities could be found at restaurants such as the Salon India Restaurant, the Taj Mahal Hindu Restaurant, or the Hotel des Artistes, where they met under the aegis of the Indian Home Rule League of America, or the League of Oppressed People. So these social spaces, I'm suggesting, were crucial for connecting elite students with subaltern workers and with anti-colonial revolutionaries. There's no direct evidence, as we know, and we keep trying to find it, of Ambedkar's presence in these spaces. However, increased traffic between the world inside and outside the university gates did leave a mark on his thought in ways both direct and indirect, I suggest. So further iterations of this course, uh, which accompanies the building of the finding gate, will add to the finding gate, we hope, by among other things, asking about the impact of multiple social forces on Ambedkar, starting with his own writing, which suggests a scholarly young Ambedkar right, uh, relishing his freedom from the daily experiences of caste humiliation. Attention to the associational dynamics within and without the university campus thus reveals key connections between public activism, a diversifying student body and the politics of the classroom, as I've said. And this informs the conception of the finding aid, the Ambedkar finding aid is an open-ended iterative archive curated, not found, right, but curated actively by student researchers working collaboratively to study varying aspects of the social life of the university. Our finding gate draws on resources such as the Columbia Spectator, the University Registrar's Files. As well, students can cross-reference their findings by drawing on the outstanding, as I've said, open access that uh, SADA has, um, as well as digging into some of the other students who happened to be in Columbia and or in the vicinity at the time. 
um, or they might cons uh, uh, consult this, the collections of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, digital items at the LSC, and a range of other digital and physical repositories. So pursuing that related line of force, we seek simultaneously to mobilize personal correspondence, private papers, the administrative lives of the university personnel to shed light on the complex relationship between the university and its outside. Harlem, New York, the US, India, during the interwar period. Finding Gate with us helped to clarify that Ambedkar's education at Columbia occurred at a decisive moment in the formation of the social sciences, when the social question came to predominate academic thinking and the progressive thought at the turn of the century was enriching academic life even as it was becoming establishmentarian too. Um, I will come to come to the essay and the reading. But if you'll uh, um, permit me just a moment to think a little bit about archival ethics. The archival unevenness that's a defining feature of the Ambedkar archive, whether in India or in the United States, and I have a whole section on the archive in India, but I think this might not be the time or the place uh, to get into that because that's a rather long section, but it indexes a broader crisis of ethics, politics, and interpretation. As I've noted earlier, the governing conditions of archival absence and efforts to animate this Ambedkar finding aid as a form of counter memory is specific to each location and their histories, not to mention their histories of collection, curation, and so forth, and the relationship between state and popular archives. How likely embed questions about the politics of exclusion and the ethics of access into the very act of curating the finding aid? We continue to puzzle because this is a very, very difficult question. We continue to puzzle over the relationship between bringing Ambedkar into public awareness here, I'm thinking the US, and redressing inequities there. We ask whether and how the finding aid can benefit scholars, especially Dalit scholars and researchers in particular, by enabling access to the university as a matter of right, of historical redress. And I think as we all know, sitting in various institutions, uh, this is the hardest thing to do and uh, in many contexts proves near impossible. Such ethical issues are persistent and often difficult to resolve due to the material constraints that I very briefly wanted to discuss and which ought to, I think, accompany any discussion of archival ethics. The first, the enclosure of South Asia materials in archives and research libraries in the North Atlantic, the high costs of international travel, stringent visa restrictions, mean that the very people involved in creating and maintaining the Ambedkar archive in India only some of whom are professional academics, are unlikely to have the chance to visit these archives. Second, questions about copyright, the sequestering of material behind prohibitive paywalls, and the bundling of journals that monetize academic labor, ours, yes, organizes the uh, International Academy. They function as key impediments to the utopian promise of open access and full, in full inclusion. Thus, one should remain agnostic about the benefits, it seems to me, of digitization and challenge its equation with so-called open access. The digital image is itself ephemeral and unstable, plus it's never merely a copy of a paper original, but it enables new contexts of visual encounter and engagement, which alter the logics of order and sense attached to the paper archive, sometimes in revealing and exciting ways. So efforts to digitize endangered archives and protect archives at risk have surely played an important role in stabilizing the challenging ecologies, dust, humidity, moisture, insects, poor paper quality that govern the materiality of those archives while welcoming them into domains of virtual publicity and open access that bypass the condescension of the state archive. However, digital unevenness and inequity, poor bandwidth, power outage, the inability to store large quantities of data, continued costs of technical expertise, technological obsolescence, can also circumvent these efforts and, inside, and instead reproduce data darkness and social exclusion. And finally, efforts to publicize lesser known archives might themselves come to be viewed as acts of upper caste and class appropriation and new practices of costist accumulation. Meanwhile, publicity might subject those who maintain such repositories 
to enormous personal risk. And we know this, uh, and we know very well the moment uh, in which uh, we live now uh, during challenging political times. So the finding gate then is continuously animated by questions about access, equity as an extension of ongoing pedagogy enacted through practices of symptomatic reading and attention to the material contexts of scholarly production, the space of the city, the architecture of the classroom, the practice of working with and interrupting forms of archival regularity and recursivity, all of which opens the door to understanding Ambedkar as a globally significant figure whose words and worlds were shaped by his time, whether by the formation of the social sciences or his engagement with the paradox of racial democracy in the United States in the moment of Jim Crow. We take inspiration from recent scholarship on the complicity between American universities and the histories of enslavement, racialization, and ongoing corporatization in the United States, which approach the archive as central to practices of institutional accountability. The ethical entailments of such a project lie in its invitation to turn the university inside out in order to cultivate, cultivate a more responsible um, relationship to it. To date, racializing processes have been the focus, but the Ambedkar Finding Gate would offer a rich resource for visiting issues of caste and race as problems for historical comparison that took on renewed uh, pertinence in the interwar. The transnational archive that tracks Ambedkar across America, Britain, and India can reveal vital links between global intellectual currents, like, for example, disciplinary concerns with the social question, as well as Ambedkar's own distinctive address to the historical presence of caste and untouchability. However, as I've said before, the two halves of this archive do not cohere. While the Ambedkar archive in India elaborates the complex, multifaceted public life of one of India's most important social theorists and political thinkers of the last century. Ambedkar's relative absence from the university archive at Columbia provides an opportunity to curate an open-ended archive or a finding aid that reflects his innate worldliness. Taking Ambedkar outside India thus becomes a necessary and defining moment in reframing the context of re reception for this audacious and insurgent thinker. So now I will uh, enter a slightly different uh, zone of kind of reading and engagement. Um, and this, this is called race caste in um, comparison. The essay Casts in India, Their Mechanism, Genesis, and Development was written in 1916 by Ambedkar, then age 25, for Alexander Goldenweiser's seminar on primitive and modern societies. It was published in the Indian Antiquary the following year. The Indian Antiquary was founded by J. Burgess in 1872, and it was later taken over by Sir Richard Temple and kept up its publication until 1933. The journal was an important precursor to um, Epigraphica Indica and Ep Epigraphia, uh, Epigraphia Indica, excuse me, and Castes in India featured in volume 46, where it was noted that, quote, in the half century intervening 1872 to 1922, they, Indian scholars, that is, have become so numerous as to be able to, with great credit to themselves, fill nearly the whole journal, right? The journal's focus on the ancient Indian past is evident in Ambedkar's own essay, which approaches Indology as a form of sociology, yet offers a radically different interpretation of castes and origins. Now, Goldenweiser was a student of Franz Boas, and both were known to reject ideas of racial hierarchy rooted in biological assumptions about race. The text casts in India as evidence of how his education at Columbia might have allowed Ambedkar to understand a caste comparatively and historically. Caste had never been theorized before by an outcast student who experienced democracy in adult life, however flawed, for the first time while undergoing higher education. And it should be no surprise that the two levels of experience, phenomenological and intellectual, shaped each other. Ambedkar's persistence of inequality was shaped by his and for him unprecedented experience of equality. Ambedkar's rigorous engagement with sociological theory offers students a chance to inquire into the formation of the social science disciplines in the period, as I've said, 
even as the, it allows or asks us to sharpen our skills of close reading, annotation, and interpretation. The text simultaneously asks about subject formation, about what role identity and experience play in the structure of the text. Thus, awareness of the American context deepens the performative irony of the outcast student detailing the logic of organization of a fundamentally irrational, unstable order predicated on the denial of social intercourse. In Castes, Ambedkar describes himself as, quote, quite alive to the complex intricacies of a hoary institution like caste, and compares the oral presentation of his essay his performance to quote, the glib tongue of the guide, taking his visitors on a tour of an exhibition of human institutions. Though he never approaches the system of cause from a personal or an anecdotal standpoint, Ambedkar nevertheless claims expertise as a student of caste. And we should recall that Ambedkar rarely engaged in autobiographical reflection, which makes such moments all the more significant. He would, for instance, speculate on the possibility and the effects of the wiping out of untouchability through his own chosen form of exile, which involved moving through the great expanse of human intellection, exploring disciplines at will, relishing the pleasure of slow thought in the space of the university, and claiming the right to think as the first practice of freedom. There are two issues in caste that I'd like to pick up. First is the question of sex and the social. And then relatedly, there's the issue of caste's difference from race. Together and separately, they speak to caste as social form and as a condensation of social power. Now, Ambedkar takes up the mediating role of kinship in the transformation of nature to culture, but then introduces endogamy in this text as a distinct innovation in producing the social. He provides a history of caste as a social form, we will re recollect in this 15 page essay, by alerting us to the imposition of caste as enclosed class, with class here used in the sociological sense of group membership. So historically, Indian society sees the imposition of endogamy, another name for caste, Ambedkar will tell us at various points of this dense essay, an essay that bears the imprint of rather different theoretical and methodological orientations, as if caste is too complex to be explored and explained by merely one set of consistent theoretical tools. It could also be that he's 25 and he's a student and he's experimenting uh, with a range of different theories that he's been exposed to. Uh, now, the imposition of endogamy is a sort of Brahminical hat trick, he tells us, which establishes social mimesis as the basis of society, but one that is both impossible to attain and always already insufficient for breaking into that first enclosure a charmed circle that the Brahmins built around themselves. That this mimetic order is predicated on the annihilation of women, and this is fundamentally what caste is, that is caste as endogamy and nothing more. And furthermore, that endogamy itself is defined by the necropolitical schema that lies beneath the impossible requirement of an absolute parity between men and women as sexual partners for production, reproduction, and where child marriage, sati, and widowhood are all so many tools for addressing the problem of what Ambedkar calls in that spectacular uh, kind of uniform formulation, the problem of surplus woman, really marks the brilliance of this argument. In Kass in India, Ambedkar introduces the concept of surplus woman, transposing surplus from ideas about economic value to ideas about the status of women as disposable persons. And he understands the problem of the surplus woman as the consequence of enforced endogamy, observing that, quote, the problem of caste then ultimately resolves itself into one of the pairing of uh, one of repairing the disparity between the marriageable units of the two sexes within it. So the ideological commitment to endogamy produces a set of attendant dilemmas about how best to satisfy the need for reproductive heteronormativity within each caste. There is no biological mechanism by which to control for reproductive parity, so that an equal number of male and female children are either born at any given time or that they're going to be married at any given point in time. Right? And there is the problem of one spouse dying before the other. 
So the logical problem of measure and equivalence, recall that this is a political economist first and foremost, the logical problem of measure and equivalence thus translates here into the social problem of parity and lack around the couple form, which is menaced by the problem, uh, by the presence, excuse me, of surplus woman and surplus man. Now, Ambedkar is dry and analytical as he describes the uh, resolution of the problem of surplus man and surplus woman. While in classical economics, the extraction of surplus and the value form are viewed as progressive iterations of the economic process, here surplus woman bears the brunt of social discipline and sexual violence because the fact of sexual difference privileges the position of men in relation to women in society. And therefore, surplus woman poses a double danger. She can marry outside caste, thus violating the rules of caste endogamy, or she could encroach on the chances of unmarried women in her own caste, right? That is younger women who are up for marriage. Widow burning sati might be the get best guard against the possibility of social infraction. I quote here, being dead and gone, Surplus woman creates no problem of remarriage, either inside or outside the caste. Since this is a difficult demand to fulfill, quote, compulsory widow widowhood is superior to burning because more practicable, Ambedkar tells us. So long as the caste can be sure that the widow is, quote, degraded to a condition in which she is no longer a source of allurement. So the imposition of social death on surplus women means that she's no longer a sexual threat to other women of marriageable age, neither does her waywardness risk compromising group morality. It's clear that endogamy cannot be enforced in practice without resolving the problem of surplus. Endogamy and surplus, regulation and excess together organize on Baker's explanation of caste as both inherently unstable and somewhat schizophrenic not merely artificial, but also illogical and enforced by intimate violence. So if kinship is the hinge between nature and culture, between savage sexuality and the regulation of patrilineal descent, past endogamy is a specific form of enactment of the transposition from nature to culture in this case. Endogamous marriage secures not merely the ideology of patrilineal descent, but it also enables hierarchical distinction between groups. It's notable that all this is predicated on the regulation of female sexuality, itself secured by the threat of gendered violence. So after arguing in castes, caste in India, that caste and its grammar originated when enforced endogamy succeeded exogamy, Ambedkar becomes quickly aware that this functionalist position, though it's intellectually compelling, is historically untenable. Though Ambedkar gives pride of place to enforced endogamy in castes, he would later argue that it was but one among a range of socio-sexual forms and a rarity in early India. And we should really think about Ambedkar's position between S.V. Ketkar, from whom he takes the argument about endogamy, but really refines it and makes it the only kind of structure and structure for understanding caste, it seems to me, and Gurye, and I'll come to Gurye in a second. By stretching his analysis back in time, Ambedkar is forced to reckon with explaining how exactly it was that social exogamy, that is the fact that castes could marry with each other across, outside, of each, uh, outside of caste, how it is that um, sexual exogamy, uh, the conjugation of caste mixtures, gave way to caste endogamy. Indeed, as he digs deeper into ideological explanations for the origin of castes, Ambedkar becomes aware that the neat logic of surplus and parity laid out in castes cannot explain the relatedness and conflict across millennia that is found in the ideological record, which speaks to the constant birthing of new caste through forms of miscegenation, whether it's anuloma or pratiloma, unions, not just marriages. So like S.V. Ketkar, <clears throat> Another influential Ambedkar contemporary in Maharashtra, G.S. Gurye, trained in Indology and chaired the University of Bombay Sociology Department from 1924 through 1959, identified Brahmanism and the caste system as essential features of Indian and Hindu civilization, 
examining traditional knowledge systems, religious practices, social organization, and law as represented in Sanskrit sources in tandem with the discussion of contemporary practices, suggesting continuities between the past, uh, the, between the present and the distant past. Yet Ambedkar's own distinctive strategy was to rely on the Indological record in order to take down the edifice of caste logically and ideologically, rather than to give it a kind of, uh, to put it on a respirator as it were, which is what, you know, Gurye does. So what I've done here is to merely flag the precocity of Ambedkar's argument about sex and the social, sex as the social, and thus also the presentation of caste as social form and a perverse form of sociality predicated on a logic of social function. This brings me to race. Now we know Ambedkar is interested in the classic sociological problem of group formation, how and why it occurs and what form it may take. Cass furnishes our young student with a peculiar yet productive example of the formation of social class. We've already noted that Ambedkar challenged, challenged Manu's power to lay down the law, arguing that the historical Manu had merely engaged in the work of codification by giving existing social customs the status of social rules. And he also challenges the idea that the Shastras had brought caste into being. He writes, quote, there is a strong belief in the mind of Orthodox Hindus that the Hindu society was somehow molded into the framework of the caste system and that it is an organization consciously created by the Shastras, end quote. Caste's historicity contradicted efforts to map textual caste onto caste's social existence. And Ambedkar shows castes to be a product of sexual violence and violation, as well as the enforced separation of groups. These two processes collided, overlapped, and converged, but they also often diverged. The heteronymous proliferation of mixed castes, who required a place in the Varna hierarchy, attested, attested to this historicity of caste. Nobody ever calls her, not here. Uh, but um, so attested to the historicity of caste itself. Now, the logic governing caste structure, however, resided in the principle of separation that produced the parceling of an already homogeneous unit. And we are thus left with the complexity of caste's origin, as Ambedkar so astutely recognized. And it's worth remembering that he approaches the problem of origins indirectly, at least in caste in India, via synchronic study of caste as assemblage, a strange multiplicity comprising primitive and modern elements governed by the mechanism of endogamy. In fact, Ambedkar addresses origins via its traces through the persistence of exogamy that is visible in the conjugation of castes, the persistence of these mixed castes, and through the reproduction of caste by imitation of the Brahmin as a historically specific form of social power. And the reason also that I'm drawing some attention to caste in India is that this is a text that he keeps coming back to um, and argues that he holds firm in some sense to the um, analytics and the social analysis that he had put in place in this text, even though, as we know, the rest of his oeuvre would kind of, cons you know, quite, uh, um, you know, quite significantly elaborate on many of these arguments that he is making here. Now, Ambedkar would make three arguments that form the backdrop to the question of caste's origins here in this text. The first is that India is a cultural unity. Second, that a provisional answer to the question of caste's origin is provided by the mechanism of endogamy. He's not able to actually ever get to the question of the origin of caste. That is, it's an enforced social rule which relies on the exercise of gendered violence both within and across caste. And third and most important, that caste is a partitioning of the social whole and, thus, and, and that it thus presents us with the sociological puzzle of understanding the relationship of part to whole. This is unlike race, he argues, which poses the problem of finding a unifying mechanism for territorially differentiated and culturally distinct groups. So here, the logical operations of complementarity, opposition, separation, repulsion, and encompassment are each at play, all very, very important emergent sociological concept, uh, concepts too, or conceptions. Um, so uh, in the way that Ambedkar presents caste as a relation of relations, 
However, beginning as Ambedkar does with India as a cultural unity and caste as a form of artificial and imposed separation, it's clear that unlike race difference, social differences, he argues, in India are of a different kind from those in the United States and in Europe. And therefore, in caste, Zambedkar analyzes the violence of caste also without any reference to untouchability, which is um, quite interesting. Even independent of untouchability, then, caste is already constituted by sexual violation within and between castes. Now, Golden Weiser's teacher Boaz had challenged race hierarchy and evolutionism by positing the cultural by the, positing the cultural concept as an alternative, with cultures viewed as bounded and separate, thus de-emphasizing internal division and prioritizing shared values governing a cultural whole. Instead, Ambedkar argues that caste does not operate like race, writing that caste endogamy is different from endogamy amongst the Negroes and the whites and the various tribal groups that go by the name of American Indians in the United States, who, and I continue to quote, who are culturally different, making their abode in localities more or less removed and having little to do with each other. Caste, however, is a partitioning of the whole, following the logic of parceling, of self-duplication, which was caused by and was a consequence of that first primordial Brahmin enclosure. But how had this internal division, this principle of separation, come about? In caste, Ambedkar struggles to explain a structure governed by a peculiar force of separation, fission and division of the social whole. And the problem he lays out in caste, he will dramatically modify 20 years later in the annihilation of caste, where he will prioritize the relationship between untouchability and Hindu religion as the point of contradiction that can bring caste to crisis. Later, he will talk about the untouchables as a part apart and argue that, quote, Hindu society as such does not exist. It is only a collection of castes. And he'll go on to suggest that the division between touchable and untouchable and the principle of untouchability itself is what affects the separation of society from itself. And he'll articulate a revolutionary project that seeks the destruction of this edifice. Ambedkar's challenge to those advocating the reform of caste is clearly stated in AOC in the Annihilation of Caste criticize a, ref uh, a reform of the social limited to the uxorial rules described in castes, rather than a total critique of caste itself. And in an oft-repeated and well-known statement early on in that text, he points to those reformers who, quote, and I quote, felt quite naturally a greater urge to remove such evils as enforced widowhood, child marriage, etc., evils which prevailed among them and which was personally felt by them. They did not stand up for the reform of Hindu society. The battle that was fought centered around the question of the reform of the family. It did not relate to social reform in the sense of the breakup of the caste system, which actually is the destruction uh, of uh, the reigning uh, order of the family and the form of the couple. And as we know, in the annihilation of caste, um, uh, Ambedkar calls for the death of Hindu religion for caste annihilation in the interest of social revolution. This is not yet apparent when we read castes, but there are intimations. In castes in India, the student of sociology discovers the mechanism that makes caste cohere. He has yet to spell out the political, the ethical, and the existential implications of caste separation. He has only just begun to think about the outcast, the boycotted, and those defined as untouchable and unseeable. In fact, the term untouchability, as I said, doesn't appear in that 1916 paper. But in 1916, his growing awareness of the internal division of the whole intimates a revolution in thought. Unlike his predecessors from Maharashtra, like Phule or Gopal Baba Valankar or Vital Ramji Shinde, Ambedkar thinks sociologically according to the rules of that emergent discipline and arrives at its limits. So he'll also think the limits of the equality principle in order to effect social revolution, to bring caste to crisis, as I said, and to engage in the project of caste annihilation. 
But one thing is certain, um, Baker's ways of thinking about the social question is charged because of the way he is already articulating the internal division, the partitioning of the social whole, that is the non-relation of part to whole as one of the defining features of caste. Us in India thus cues us um, to the uh, cues us that the question of caste is a question of the constitution of the social, and that caste's negative sociality is a product of the peculiarity of the internal division, the partitioning of the whole. The social whole is internally divided because caste is vociferous. The whole is so internally divided that it's neither the sum of its parts nor can it represent them. The parts are actually agonistically related to each other through violent separation, but they're also pulled together by the force of imitation. And I think this focus on the psychic life of caste, on the mimetic force uh, of caste and on caste imitation is extremely critical in this early text. So in caste in India, Ambedkar's efforts to divide the manifestations of social caste into origins, functioning or mechanism, and ideology or power, its development, we might say, keep returning him to the question of mechanism. What makes the machine tick, right? Folded into the problem of mechanism is the iterative dimension of castes as self-duplicating and vociferous. Once the principle of endogamy is established as a social rule. Relatedly, the ideological power of Brahmanism and the high status of the sociological Brahmin is a consequence of their having perfected the rule of caste endogamy, which others seek to replicate by imitation. What this does is to give to caste an unstable organizing center. Interestingly, Ambedkar refers to the principle of excommunication as mechanistic, as he observes that it articulates the first cleavage between Brahmin and non-Brahmin. And I quote, while making themselves into a caste, the Brahmins, by virtue of this, created a non-Brahmin caste or to express it in my own way. By closing themselves in, they closed others out. Uh, I end quote. So the penalty for the offense of breaking established caste rules, he goes on to note, is excommunication. And the result of that is a new caste. So the dual logic of excommunication and imitation, both together and separately, describe the social physics of caste. It explains the social reproduction of caste as a complex totality. At one point, Ambedkar mourns the frailty of those who merely followed along. He notes, this completes the story of those who were weak enough to close their doors, he tells us. In later work, Ambedkar's focus will be on those who didn't follow along and whose ideas challenged the very ideology of caste. But here in caste in India, the Columbia student has discovered the logic of social reproduction but has yet to elaborate his own demands for social revolution. So I might then use this as a way to return to the point I began with regarding the ways in which this kind of brief um, kind of journey through a situated materialist reading that I've tried to offer here might put pressure on standard methods of both thinking about um, questions around thought uh, but also the methods of doing uh, intellectual history by really forcing us to think through maybe the text context relationship in a slightly different um, way. So I'll stop there. raise your hand and, and jump in if, if you would like to here. Um, thank you, Annie. That was that was amazing. Um, and I feel I've, there's lots of questions I have about the kind of the, what you're doing, mm. the project you're doing in Colombia, as well as as your kind of your reading here of, of, of Ambedkar's thought too. Um, 
I yeah, I, I feel like my thinking is in one sense is is, is on that course at the moment. So this is something that you haven't run yet, but you're developing. Is that correct? So oh, or, yeah, the, yeah, with the tool. Um, I so I mean I think one of the things that's really interesting here is is being able to engage these questions through a person. Through, engage the institution through a person rather than sort of starting with the institution which I think gives you you know you pass that out very nicely these different kinds of spaces um, and the inner and the outer I guess one of the questions I had was about how I mean you, you framed how the university works for Ambedka very clearly here but I'm wondering a bit about how students will engage with that from their own experiences mm -hmm. with their own reading yeah. of it here now um, and thinking about um, the teleologies mm -hmm. that can play out here and ideas of um, translatability of ex different forms yes. of exclusion yes. and inclusions um, and how you've encountered those questions so far and how you're anticipating those yeah. and what that means for this space. You know, this, there is a history of the university that is peripherally in this project but which haunts our everyday absolutely, existence absolutely yeah, yeah. um no that's that's you know um i this is an ongoing question right and each classroom in a sense produces a different set of both problems and questions but also responses now in terms of you know i've i've taught the course twice i should say right or uh, no i taught it once and i'm going to teach it the second time um but in the meantime there's been a kind of you know collaborative ongoing project um thinking through sort of these modes of near and far reading so I think, yeah, I mean, you know, the question of sort of translation that, you know, the, the history of the university then and the history of the university now, the question of responsibility and complicity, mm -hmm. which many of the students are coming, I think, into the classroom with, and more broadly yet perhaps the moment that we're in the political and the intellectual moment that we're in, um, where many of these questions about inclusion within the university as a kind of social form and a real space, uh, but as well the kinds of knowledge that has been produced in the university and being held accountable to them are just so, um, you know, they're, they're, they're so profoundly sort of salient and present and with us. And one of the things that, you know, I would like to try to do uh, is to harness uh, much of that kind of critical reflection, sometimes and very often at an elite institution with students coming from elite backgrounds, not all by any means, but certainly many, is I think to maybe harness uh, questions around sort of guilt, complicity, et cetera, to harness that towards some notion of kind of intellectual and institutional responsibility. So it seems to me that to actually get students to think about the space that they are in, to think about questions of the curriculum, to think about practices of reading as themselves having, you know, both the kind of long history, but it's a very complicated history, right? Because the university is not just a mode of exclusion. It's also a space of um, absolute kind of fascination and a desire for inclusion within the university. You see this with Ambedkar, you see this with many others. And so I think it's that relationship between both kind of, you know, social emancipation or kind of mass intellectuality, democratic education on the one hand, and then the very real social and sociological circumstances of exclusion that, um, I don't know, one would like to at least push students, I think, to think about this through some model of kind of historical responsibility and accountability, right? Hence, I mentioned the, the uh, university and slavery model that many institutions have now adopted. Now, again, to your point, you know, Ambedkar doesn't translate well in that context, right? Most students who might see a race cast in the university course, which is what this is called, they come, you know, either one has students coming from a South Asia context, mm -hmm where they've got some sense of what, you know, caste is, and then they have been introduced to uh, the new caste studies and to kind of anti-caste thought and so on, but may not have any sense of the American university in the interwar. Yeah. Or you have students coming in who have really a kind of keen sense, and many of them have come from that CU and slavery course, who have a sense of what it means to do archival work on the university and work in the university archives, 
but what do you do with this kind of weird figure who actually doesn't exist in our university archive, right? So that imaginative leap. So I think there, there is both the kind of um, imaginative leap that both sets of students have to make. Um, very often, uh, and I'm quite comfortable doing this, but this is as a teacher uh, in the classroom, um, I think it's good for students to be a little and maybe even more radically kind of defamiliarized and destabilized and just throw them a text and say, what would you do with this? And it's kind of remarkable what students are actually able to do with the text who don't bring to it a particular optics of reading. So they start noticing, well, what is this weird? You know, why does he keep using this term enclosure? This is really weird. What is this? Well, you say to them, well, how might you read enclosure, right? And then suddenly it's like, oh, so for some of them, it's like, oh, British history. And, you know, is this what he's talking about? Or, you know, when he talks about things like, you know, cast as a kind of virus and this model of self-duplication or sociological thinking. What does it mean to engage in sociological thinking at a moment when the discipline of sociology and anthropology don't exist as two distinct disciplines? They're actually conjoined, right? And he is also thinking about this through political economy, where economics as a discipline has not made its, you know, kind of shift away from more historicist ways of thinking the economy, right? Um, so I think for students maybe to, to um, encounter that almost as a as a set of forms or things that they kind of pick up on but they're not quite sure what's going on it can produce some interesting things um but i think the question of sort of translation across two very different sort of playbooks or reading lists that is always really hard which is why um i think the focus on text annotation close reading begins to produce and provide a kind of shared definitional universe for students. And then you can start kind of, you know, getting them to think about, well, here's Boaz, here's Giddings, here's the fact that both of them really are um, reaching, in a sense, uh, the new science through female students. If we think about people like Elsie Cruz Parsons and Zora Neale Hurston, you know, who are the people who are actually carrying the message of the new science at this time? And these are all these are women. And that I think is very interesting, whether it's, you know, Benedict or Mead or um, any of the others, Vina Deloria and so on. And all of the, you know, these are all folks who are at this institution. And Baker is there at this time. And I think that very complex world of the university and Harlem um is one that i just want students to think about because you can walk <laughs> you know you can actually walk you can see the gates you can move within and outside the institution and begin to actually get some sense of what this means to be in a space that has a radical insurgent popular you might say a kind of street university history if you think about Harlem as that and indeed it is that because you know you have Unia and Garvey and the you know the the conflicts and the debates between let's say Du Bois and Garvey. You know, a lot of this is happening on the streets, right? And so on. It's happening in spaces that are um, that are not formal educational institutions. So then I think to just start asking and posing this question of, of um, intellectual labor and what it means to be educated. Um, which is so significant for someone like Ambedkar, for all of the anti-caste theorists. This is the first, you know, this is the first enclosure that has to be broken, right? So I think just to, you know, begin to think about that, I think produces maybe a more um, rich sense of responsibility, one that's hopefully not paralyzing. And which is not just too easy, you know, in terms of saying, oh, well, you know, I'm really critical. Well, okay, sit down and do your time in the archive. You know, the archives really, really, <laughs> where you have to be honest to the archive. And all of you know this, right? That really sitting and, you know, being in the archive creates a kind of honesty to that empirical material. And then you really have to <laughs> think through, you know, the easy critique in a slightly more difficult and complicated way. Yeah, I think also that sort of spatialization of audience and influences also helps to break up 
the institution. Yes, I think yes. In a very interesting way. Absolutely. In and, you know, opening up things that, you know, one hasn't known, right? Because you can approach this in many different ways. You could actually approach this by saying, what's, you know, how do we get to political economy? You know, what else is going on at this time? I mean, there's a huge conversation around things like eminent domain, the railways. I mean, all of this is really, really critical in terms of the organization of you know, political economic knowledge at this time. So you could say, you know, what's happening in terms of political economy? What's happening through this race caste comparison? How does he come to? So there's many different cuts, right? Do you want to engage in a Boasian reading? Yeah. Do you want to focus on Dewey? Do you want to think Seligman and so on? Yes, so questions in the chat. Those of you joining us online, please do add your questions to the, to the Zoom thing and I will read those out, but please. <laughs> Hmm. Are we working with 1619, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. To, 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 I think, the two main ones. Um, I think this question of sort of archive and absence is very, very important. And it's a little bit different from the other question that you asked. And, um, and, and the question of origins, because as I said, you know, in, in, in the later work, uh, indeed, he both stretches um, the sub you know, subcontinental history much, much, much uh, further back into the into the past, and also discovers a kind of you know uh, uh, an agent, uh, an uh, an agent in terms of a kind of uh, structuring uh, antagonism between what uh, Ambedkar will call Buddhism and Brahmanism as actually both the motor of history, but also the kind of agonistic framework for thinking about the history of caste in the long term. But there are places, you know, and and he does some of this work in the late forties. Um, but there are places, again, to the point of kind of autobiography and the interesting ways to read for that. There are places where, you know, he will argue that um, the untouchable is, is missing in the historical record, right? And, and that what one needs to engage in, I think I talked about critical fabulation, that one actually needs to engage in a kind of imaginative 
act that allows you to suture between point A and point B, right? That to make that jump, you actually need to be able to rethink the historical record in the way that you might um, a kind of literary aesthetic work. Now, I see that not as him engaging in fabulation, i.e. not real, not true, but that this question of origins is incredibly, A, it's complicated, B, the question of origins is a kind of prehistory to what he really wants to be doing, it seems to me, right? So the origin is not ever, it seems to me, the, the, the question for anyone. It's, it's an animating fiction to get a system going, right? It's the fiction of the social contract, well, you know, or the Hobbesian, you know, um, idea of, of, of society is, you know, in a sense, living in a state of civil war. So that animating fiction, you know, origins are that kind of an animating fiction. They have to, in a sense, allow you to then get the motor going and allow you to tell the story that you want to tell. And so this, I think, is, you know, so this is a, excuse me, a very, very interesting question about archive and absence. It also has a lot to do with the Ambedkar archive in India and the question of what did Ambedkar read and how, which is also, I think, you know, to your question about Marx and his engagement more broadly with the traditions of kind of British socialism, which I think, again, he sees as being much, much, much more um, elaborate, expansive and capacious and merely thinking through Marx, right? And so, um, so, so that archive is, is an interesting, engaged and complicated archive, uh, both of material that he has to read in translation because he doesn't, he can't access the Sanskrit texts, but then as well his own understanding of kind of universal history. And that I think is, you know, uh, if you, you, I don't know how you want to think about Marx, but you know, this is a problem for all moderns, right? That some kind of an investment in universal history, uh, it doesn't matter whether you think cost is that, uh, is that animating motor or you think value or labor and so on. So that question I think is, is really interesting. Now your second question about sort of using cost to think race and are people wrong? Um, again, I think they're using cast here as a concept metaphor. I mean, you might be thinking about Isabel Wilkerson, but that's only the latest of a long range of works. I mean, there's a cost school of social relations, which, you know, had many other people in the mix and she actually gestures to that tradition, which is a kind of Chicago school tradition as well. Um, and then, you know, even stretching much further back, kind of, you know, engagements with um, slave abolition and mission Christianity and the ways in which American caste, I think, has a very long history going way back into the early 19th and even before the 18th century, but really from the early early 19th century onwards. So I think there when folks are using caste, um, to think about race, they are seeing it as a concept metaphor. It's 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 a form of defamiliarization, right? It's like the shock of saying, well, you know, you thought race was, yes, it might be awful, but if it's 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 nothing if it's not modern. <laughs> and here we've got this, you know, archaic traditional, you know, social structure and system and practice, and we're likening it to that. So I think it's meant to produce a kind of you know intellectual shock, right? It's like this is, this is not something that we quite understand. Why would you say this? But then, you know, more complicatedly, it seems to me, the caste argument opens up, and I don't think it's class-like. I think caste is a very, very complex form of social inequality that is uh, hydra-headed. Um, it might be class-like at times, but it is also a system uh, that regulates status. It's a mode of organization of uh, social and reproductive labor, sexual and reproductive labor. It's a legislated order. It's an order of occupation and labor and ability to labor and uh, derive value from, from that labor and so on. So I don't think it's just class. Um, but I think, again, when people are thinking about the race as being caste-like, the other thing that they also want to think through are all of the kind of non-material practices, right? Prejudice, discrimination, outcasting, exclusion, the kind of what we, I guess, now would call sort of microaggressions as well. So the kind of status order, the psychic life of caste, like the psychic life of race, which goes beyond merely kind of material parity, right? And I think that's what maybe that kind of comparison is, is enabling for people. And I think we should respect it. 
Um, does that mean that those are scholars of caste? I don't think so. Uh, you know, uh, just like I would hesitate to, to call myself a scholar of race, uh, but uh, I don't think so, yeah. <laughs> so there's a series of questions um, online. May I do you want me to take a few? Together? Well, I was going to group them together a little bit. Yes, yes. so there's, there's a series from Shoab Qureshi, um, one which is a request to send the link of, of the recording at the end, which I think we will do. Don't worry about that. Um, there's then there's another kind of point of information, which is a question about whether or not Columbia University maintains an active subscription to Dalit Voice, founded by V. T. Rajshekar in 1981. No, no. Uh, I mean, although, I mean, they might, but I'm not absolutely sure how current. Yeah. I mean, there's a, I, I know there's a question yeah. about do you maintain a subscription? But I mean, I think that touches on the, the point you were making earlier about kind of. The ethics of this this archive and yeah. kind of sharing information mm -hmm. um, and then there's a, a number of questions that are more around past struggles in the present moment um, so a request to, to comment on how you see the caste system has the caste system in india been strengthened by the modi regime has the position of dalits improved um, and a request for your thoughts if you would like to share them on the recent banning of Dalit activists in Mozi Sundarajan at, uh, at Google in North America due to protests by other Hindu employees. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't the North American environment weakened caste tendencies? Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a political commentator. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm going to have to make a leap from the paper I gave to the paper that I should have given. <laughs> but I will try. Uh, no, I think the first question, you know, about the voice, and I think as you're um, suggesting also, Eleanor, that, you know, the, the, the bigger question behind it is, you know, do you have actually access mm. to um, the world of kind of ephemeral pamphlet production, chapbooks, et cetera, et cetera? And again, to that point, uh, you know, Western libraries and universities are uh, kind of vacuuming machines. They're Hoover, uh, Hoovers or whatever, right? Uh, so there is a great deal of interest if those things can be accessed, I think, to actually gather them um, and to preserve them. And uh, they do do right by the logics and the politics of preservation and the ethics of preservation, I should say, excuse me. Uh, but Dalit voice in particular, I'm not absolutely sure if I know that there were some that we used to get, but a lot of this is also very contingent on faculty themselves to your point that, you know, uh, we are here and therefore certain things happen. So, you know, I'm here and therefore I teach a particular course and not something else. And, or I go to the librarian and say, hey, you've got to go and, you know, get all of this material. So I think that there is that kind of patchiness, but, um, uh, and then the, the bigger question still might be who can access you know uh, Clio uh, which is our search engine for Colombia so back to this question I think again of access we are all great um, about you know making a bid for digital humanities and talking about open access and making information available uh, but you know we work with in, incredibly you know uh, difficult structures and corporatized structures um, to make any of those things possible and I think one also has to be quite um, honest about this, right? This is not just about, you know, can I, you know, do I feel that this should be done? Of course, but can I do it? Most times, probably not. So I think we should be honest about it. Uh, the Modi regime, the caste system, I, this I think is a very um, complicated and a very large question. Uh, what we might think about, uh, to my point about the significance of Ambedkar today, is that the Modi regime itself also um, has its own uh, understanding and response and relationship to the figure of Ambedkar. Right, and wants to see him as part of a broader pantheon of, of other figures. Right. And therefore, there is a certain, uh, we could say, a certain kind of both a misreading uh, or a rejection of the insurgent Ambedkar in favor of the constitutional Ambedkar. You know, so, um, and that's, you know, quite easy. I mean, why not? Yes, he is an extraordinary constitutional thinker. Um, he does, you know, he does chair uh, the, the, the drafting committee of the Indian constitution. You can't take that away from him. And it's an extraordinary document. And so the constitutional Ambedkar and the Ambedkar who 
um, you know, an ambassador does this all the time, right? He works within the system, and then he's constantly also speaking to the limits of the system. So he'll participate, you know, in the in, in the, the you know uh, in the the constitution uh, and draft in the drafting committee of the constitution. But of course, we also know that he says that well, this is a document which, if it can't actually put in place social democracy, not political democracy, then it's you know it's it's worth it's a document that. Can can be burned, just like, you know, in Mahar, I tried to burn um, Manu, <laughs> Manu's Dharma Shastra, not burn Manu, but Manu's Dharma Shastra, right? So that, you know, I have no fealty to the document as such, even if I've played a role in it. And he'll constantly do this as a way to, I think, both mark the necessity of working within an organizational and institutional and a policy framework always, he never says no to that, but always to mark also his own um, relationship to any of those, those forms and practices of centralizing power, if you will, that is his own kind of marginal position there his own experience of inhabiting the margins and always being a kind of insurgent voice that is kind of sniping from the sidelines, if you will, right? And so he's constantly doing this. And I think that's a very important aspect of his own um, political thought, if you will, the way that he, he works it. And there's a constant recursivity in his thought as well. He keeps coming back to questions, asking them in new ways. And so this early, late kind of Ambedkar, you know, with uh, maybe annihilation of caste being a kind of dividing line, some of that makes sense, but other bits of that uh, don't quite make sense because of how recursive his thought is. He keeps coming back to questions because he never feels that he's adequately answered them. He hasn't found, um, you know, that kind of the, the, the clinching explanatory logic for any of these things. And so he's kind of haunted by constantly repeating this question, where am I in the Indian historical? You know, what is cast as the social? And um, that, if one wants to read in a kind of more literary uh, mode, it is, it is that, it's, that's the, the tragic, <laughs> if you will, a kind of element there in, in Ambedkar that I think we should also think about. Uh, then there was a question about um, Tenmori and uh, equality labs. Uh, again, the bigger, response here might be the ways in which caste has traveled, not necessarily through race and, and people thinking about race through caste, but indeed about the diaspora and the way that caste has traveled and the ways in which that has been a kind of, again, an absent presence. And the fact that these things are really being brought to the surface. And these make for not just very difficult conversations, but it's producing, I think, a certain kind of a legal problem because of the modes of multiculturalism that, again, speaking of um, the Modi regime or maybe Hindu nationalists who are uh, interested in a very different hegemonic idea of uh, both India, but also of um, Hindu social relations and so on, it's producing a real problem because multiculturalism um, actually allows for an argument about hurt. Right, about community hurt that doesn't address the question of agonism, inequality within the community. And in many ways, it's reproducing what I think Ambedkar experiences in the context of something like the Puna Pact, right? So the idea of actually creating political separation becomes impossible, partly because of Gandhi, you mentioned Gandhi, but it's also because how do you imagine and re-jigger, uh, reorient the structure of agonistic intimacy, which is what caste is, and the outcast's relationship to that structure, right? And I think it's reproducing that in kind of very interesting ways here. You know, I mean, everything that Ambedkar says there about, well, social reform had no place for a radical annihilatory logic of thinking about caste. Well, you know, South Asian diaspora, especially in the US, where there's already a divide between manual and intellectual labor, right? Those who come post 65, knowledge workers, others who are part of the kind of revolutionary and or working class traditions of South Asian migration from the late 19th century onwards. There's already that divide. But now you're posing that question about caste in that context, where I think legal safeguards around US multiculturalism are going to produce some very interesting responses. 
And that's what we see here. These are, this is about sort of competing hurt, as I understand it, right? So the argument that was made about the disinvitation, again, is, is that, well, this would actually create, rather than creating the conditions for dialogue, it was going to create discord. Now, can you swallow the poison? Right? Um, and, and I think that's the kind of, you know, that's the, uh, my, my response to it. I'm very conscious that we, you are, yeah. we're working yes, you yes. hard, but I would like to give, an, Please, yeah, yeah, so if we take a few questions from the floor. Sure. If that's right, collect them. them. Of yeah, course, yes. That sounds great. Yes. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you're you're right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. People listening, this is a question about Ambedkar studying in London, his training as a lawyer, and questions of secularism and right. his thought. But we had other questions here. Yeah. yeah. Could you speak up so that people yes. are like? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you Actually, sort of uh, uh, that I would like to uh, 
uh, industrial and applied science and more applications and cost is based on diagnostic. I think I understand your question. While you were sort of like giving a talk, you tried to guess how social I think I think this working on the social. Ask. We go with the logic that whole not constituted by the What is it then? Mm -hmm. Then it also follows like from the same lifting logic. Also in the not able to see the parts carry any sort of characters. Mm -hmm. How do we investigate this? Investigate the this of it. And then do we in a sort of not inquire the origins of it, origins of the system and how, how does it begin? Because even a medical put it uh, sort of an answer where does it originate from? So you end up at the mechanisms and then what you are sort of Mm -hmm. uh, like, how the, the system the way you understand it it's manifest in different forms so it has a psychic sort of difference it has a and also mm -hmm. as well so all of these are explanations that comes towards me later how do we reconstruct the origin of the like we do not Forget about it or something. Part that you might be allowed to. So, just to follow up on the second question, which was like, you know, and if you, trans, if you understand caste as a part of art, then relationality, relationality between different sort of structure of groups becomes the analytical tool of it. How far do you think that analytical tool of relationality can really take us to understand? There is one more uh -huh. just to add to your plate. Um, <laughs> a, a question about the relevancy of Ambedkar's thinking to the BIM army and to Shamar Pride, Shamar Pride. So, again, also kind of thinking through kind of contemporary questions. And then there's also a question about um, where does everything have to fit into the US academic paradigm? Um, so I think, I mean, it doesn't. <laughs> so one thing I can say was, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yes, I think I, that feels like a, a lot to give you. Yes, so. okay. I will, I will do quick, like, yes and no responses. So I may be starting with, I'll try. Um, but, you know, where does Ambedkar fit within some of the, the new movements, the new, um, really sort of, you know, led by youth and so on. Well, you know, I think we always have to be able to read and reread and, and, you know, take down the fathers, whoever they may be, right? So the whole point of critical academic labor is to kill the father. And if that father happens to be Ambedkar, then we've got to take him down too. Um, all, no, no, which is to say that, you know, um, there are always reflections and new readings and new ways of putting texts together with others. Um, I don't think we're done with Ambedkar. Uh, maybe we're done with Gandhi, but I, you know, I mean, just in terms of the kind of intellectual output, I don't think we're done with it. So I think there's a lot of work there to be done. And I think people have um, their own approaches and ways of, of reading Ambedkar, but Ambedkar is also kind of, you know, is iconic, is a symbol, is a name. Uh, and, you know, many things happen in his name that, name, that may not be uh, they are Ambedkarite, but they are not what, you know, a strict fidelity to Ambedkar's thought might involve. But this is like saying, you know, are you an originalist in your interpretation of the Constitution? Well, you know, we know where that has taken us. Uh, so you can't be. <laughs> so I think all texts and all human beings have to be historicized in some sense. Um, you know, and I'll come to, to that other question. I liked very much this question of rereading reading or reading reading. 
reading, because I think it is reading Ambedkar reading. And this is the way that I've thought about it. And thank you for that. I like that very much. But in uh, but but then to briefly respond to your questions, yes, yes, and yes. And the constitution is also secular, but I don't think it is only Ambedkar's constitution. There are many, many things that are happening between the first sort of uh, constitutional moment, which is the colonial constitution, the Government of India Act in 1935, and then the lead up to this, uh, both with sort of uh, partition and then the constituent assembly and so on. And so I think the, the idea of kind of Indian secularism, which is a very distinctive form, which is not about the separation of religion and state, but it's actually about the parity of religious communities, regardless of their enumerated uh, uh, density, if you want to call it that, right? So the parity of you know, religious communities is the model of Indian secularism. So to that extent, it is a secular constitution, but it's a constitution that is extremely active and interventionist in producing its secularism. It engages in, you know, opening up temples. It makes sure that temple entry is allowed for everybody. It does away with sectarian differences within Hinduism and so on. So, so far as Hinduism itself is concerned, it produces a certain kind of secular Hinduism aggressively and actively through juridical intervention and reform. So may not be quite the secularism that you were thinking about. Um, I think this question, uh, I mean, these two questions actually, I think, are kind of interrelated. Uh, exclusion now, institutional murder, um, and access, institutional access on the one hand, and then on the other, you know, writing life, right? Writing personal life narratives and writing life. And that question, you know, why isn't the personal life uh, evident in, in Ambedkar? I did not mean to suggest that it's not there. I think it requires a different kind of reading, which is what I suggested that there are bits of it in caste in India. The entire sort of a preamble to annihilation of caste is, all about an autobiographical uh, argument about who Ambedkar thinks he is and why he is just, you know, and it's an extraordinary kind of an autobiographical fragment. So I think those fragments uh, appear, but part of it might also be that, you know, a, it's about conventions of the time, you might say. I mean, Gandhi is a little bit <laughs> radical in the extent to which he feels that the life requires examination and constant self-reflection and so on. It's also a kind of mode of at atonement for him, right, you could say, and we should take that quite seriously. Whereas I think here the conventions of kind of self-writing, self-narration, um, but also I think, you know, um, I think Ambedkar is, is, is playing with, with the immortals, <laughs> which is to say he's playing on the grounds of, of kind of, you know, global thinking. And the arguments there are actually arguments about logic, about analytics, and about making a kind of distinctive set of arguments that have systematicity and cohere over time. So I think that maybe makes sense. Uh, but to the question of sort of writing life now and why, I mean, Dalit writing, Dalit Sahitya, the post Ambedkarite movements around uh, literary representation as itself ethnographic. So autobiography is a certain kind of ethnography. We probably need to think about all of those things. Um, I should also personally say that I do not believe that narrating personal life stories per se is necessarily an act of kind of either authenticity, or, right? So it requires other strategies, it seems to me, of reading. But that very profound question that was asked about, you know, how do we think about the existing orders of exclusion, which also work along, I think, relations of caste, and this was your question, um, what do we do about it? Um, I, I don't have an easy response to that. You know, I, I don't think, I mean, unless you're going to talk about, again, the kinds of movements that existed and they still exist of communities really supporting young people, training them, you know, as I think, you know, you know, as exists, you know, you want to take the IAS exam. And so, you know, there are coaching classes, you would meet in Buddhist Viharas and so on. So I think unless you have some of those kinds of projects together with people from within these institutions pushing for it, as has been happening with 
students uh, around caste discrimination and so on, it's, it's a, a very difficult thing to do. And I can say that in my own institution, uh, you know, there is a recognition of um, underrepresented domestic minorities, but we don't have a way to recognize international, what we call international URMs. So you don't, you can't make an argument around affirmative action in an international frame. So just as you know, in Indian institutions now and, you, and Indian educational institutions, that entire order in many ways is in kind of tatters because of what's happening to US universities. Uh, I think here, you're, it's, it's um, institution by institution and especially in the US, which is structured so much around the presence of public universities where many of these arguments have been able to take root and private institutions where, well, you know, we do need blind, you know, uh, need blind admissions and so on, but we don't want to commit to international URMs. So I think it's a very, very complicated terrain, but it's an important question. Um, quickly uh, to this final question, agonistic intimacy, I think because Ambedkar thinks that um, Brahmins can't exist without others and untouchables can't exist without others either. It is a system of relationality. Um, and I don't know what society is except as a relation of relations, right? So this, the, the emergence of sociology and anthropology is in a sense the, uh, is about presenting society as an externalized kind of form back to us. So the idea is always that society is a kind of totality that is that exists outside of it and is presented back to us, right? This is what you see with, you know, Durkheim and, uh, you know, Mose and, you know, so all of the early sociological theorists, take your pick, are interested in thinking about society in that sense of totality and one that can be presented back to itself. Right? So in that sense, I think it is always, in a sense, assumed to be a relation of relations. And so the important innovation that Ambedkar is making is to say, well, um, what if the social relationships are profoundly deformed? What if they actually preclude social intercourse? What if they make it impossible for us to actually have egalitarian relations? right in the middle of, you know, kind of modernity, where, you know, we have a commitment to equitable relations, right? So here's this really weird order that has managed to persist by bringing together the primitive and the modern, right? And has this kind of outstanding kind of hold on social reproduction. It's able to replicate itself. How does it do this? This is a huge puzzle for him. Because I think for him, you know, that comes together with the idea that this is an order of asociality. It's not an order of sociality, right? So, you know, what was the city supposed to do? What does sociology think, you know, happens to, you know, modern human beings? Yes, they're all anomic, they're autonomous. Uh, they're all kind of rooted in <laughs> some form of melancholy, I suppose. But what is it that's going to produce the social glue? So Durkheim will talk about religion and take that very, very seriously right, as a certain kind of social glue um, that brings people together. Uh, Marx will talk about labor and the relationship between labor and capital as a kind of social glue that is that creates the relations of relations. So that, I think, is kind of also what um, Ambedkar is playing with because this is, you know, he is a person of his time. So he's not, I also don't think he's thinking thoughts Yes, he's thinking thoughts that are kind of beyond his time, but he's also very rooted and he's responding to the, the main major sociological debates of the time, totemism, religion, social glue, um, you know, uh, uh, effervescence, effervescence in social relations and so on. Um, so I think he's working through all of that. He is, you know, um, he's certainly aware of, you know, Marx and Weber and Durkheim and Gabriel Tard and, Boaz and so forth, I think, which means he's aware of the German traditions, the British, the French, the Bergson, and so on. So I think he's he's very, very well aware and, and he is um he is deeply learned. So he knows those traditions, it seems to me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for learning. Me too. And thank you to our audience yes. in person and online. Thank I'm you. Sorry we didn't get to cover everything, but I think everything in the chat, I think we covered pretty
pretty much everything else. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Thanks and again, everyone. thank you, Anu. Yeah. It's always weird to, to be to exist in, in two avatars. I'm gonna... <laughs> One which you didn't even know existed. <laughs> I think the link will go out to everyone who's, who's signed up. So.